Hello, everyone. Um, it looks like we're at about 12.15, and I know we got a power hour of lunch. Um, Bernie, I wonder if we can get started. Good Absolutely. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, and let me just do something here. Um, yeah. So, welcome. My name is Bernie Schlager, and uh, I work at the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion at uh, Pacific School of Religion. And uh, I'm really thrilled today for our lavender lunch uh, to welcome uh, Desiree Fontenot. And uh, Desiree is a collective member of Movement, Generation, Justice, and Ecology Project, and co-founder of the Queer Eco Justice Project. As a queer Black organizer, farmer, and grassroots ecologist, Desiree's movement work is focused on land and liberation, climate justice, and queering ecological education. Desi is also an alum of PSR's uh, Master of Arts in Social Transformation, our master degree program, and uh, for many years was a team member at the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies. So we are super thrilled uh, to have Desiree with us. Just a few items uh, we're recording uh, today's Lavender Lunch. We won't post any chatting uh, that goes on, so don't worry about that. Um, but without any further ado, um, Desi, the floor is yours. All right, great to see you all. Thanks for joining. Um, I know one, one more Zoom is always a commitment, so I appreciate your attendance. Uh, and I'm gonna get us started. So I'm gonna share my screen and then I'm gonna lead us through some, uh, some framing for about a half an hour. And then afterwards, I'll open it up for some questions and dialogue. There'll be some interactive pieces too. Um, and yeah, let me, let me get that going. Let's share this. All right, let's see. You all hop to my other screen, so I'm gonna bring you back over here. <laughs> I'll bring the Zoom as well. Back over here. Okay, great. So can you all see my uh, PowerPoint screen here? Okay, wonderful. Present mode. Cool. So, um, I let me just start by saying I'm really flattered to be back. It's been a long time since I've uh, been in the PSR world, and it's good to see some familiar faces here. Um, and um, I, I owe a debt of gratitude to how I came to be where I am now with Movement Generation to CLGS um, for a number of years. I went to the Creating Change Conference as a program manager for CLGS. And in 2015, I went to the single workshop at Creating Change out of 4,000 that had anything to do with climate justice, environmental movements. And there was about, I'd say a good 40 people in attendance. And it was led by Reverend Dr. Nancy Wilson, of all folks to have that intervention at Creating Change. And I ended up meeting my, my partner, the person who had become my long-term partner um, in that workshop. So just to, to bring some context. And then the next year, I ended up leading that workshop at Creating Change for a number of years, uh, bringing together folks around queer liberation and climate justice. So just a little context and, and storytelling for you all there. That was the first year I was in the MA program for social transformation. Um, so let's get going. So I like to start um, just honoring the, the wisdom of our ancestors to acknowledge that none of this is new, that folks have been weaving these connections together for a long time. Um, and with this quote from Audre Lorde, each one of us has some power that can be used somewhere, somehow to help save our earth. All right, so um, in a bigger space, I usually do this little like interactive thing, the word association. What do you, what comes up for you when you hear queer and what comes up for you when you hear ecology? Um, folks can pop things in the chat, just like give a, give a, uh, right, queer colon, things that come up for you, 
queer ecology things that come up for you. Let me see if I can see the chat here. I might not be able to. Um, let me see. Oh, there we are. There's the chat. Queer, unorthodox, brave. Uh, when I think of queer, I think of innovation, ecology, saving the earth, queer, sex drive, gender liberation, ecology, birds, nature, wildlife, trees, climate. Okay, okay. So looking at all those associations, if we were to flip some of those, is ecology a pretty unorthodox and brave space, right? Does ecology include lots of different sex and gender and liberation in it? Um, is it innovative as in queerness? Uh, all of these things like just have a lot of like shared associations. And I really like doing this activity on a whiteboard usually when we're in person, but just a little flavor before I give you some definitions that I like to play with. So queer for me uh, and for many others, you know, these definitions come from a lot of different voices and ancestors as a noun is a medley of gender and sexually diverse ways of being, identities, expressions, cultures, bodies, intimate and erotic interactions and relationships and can encompass many identities, behaviors, and processes. And as a verb, to queer is to destabilize, it's to disrupt, to expand, bend, blend, and transform what has been normalized and naturalized. And then ecology, the definition I often use in my work with NG is the study of the relationships of home and the knowledge of home. And just so we're on a little bit more shared ground on, on that definition, I wanna share with you our uh, eco means home breakdown. So the word eco comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home. And with that, an ecosystem, is all of the relationships in a home. It's not just a catalog of all of the things in one place, but all of the things that connect um, those systems and processes and beings in a place. And then ecology, the knowledge of home. And then economy, one of the uh, things that we have the strongest association with as being a certain thing, is simply the stewardship, the care, and the management of home. It's not inherently markets or gross domestic products or all of the things that we've come to associate with the way in which our globalized economy has been developed. It is simply how we take care of a place, ideally for the benefit and well-being of that place, right? And all economic activity has ecological consequences. And then ecological justice, for us, getting at the root of the word, is the state of balance between human communities and healthy ecosystems based on thriving, mutually beneficial relationships and participatory self-governance. Um, so with queer ecologies brought together, for me, this is the definition that hits home the most. Queer ecology is a lens through which we can reclaim and reimagine our bodies, our lands, our communities and movements with the knowledge that diversity assures resilience. Um, when I talk about diversity at NG, we get out of the like, all the ways that that word has become a trigger point for a lot of us and actually talk about the inextricably linked biological and cultural diversity that is the basis of our resilience on this planet. So taking a step back, just how did I get here? Um, this is a little bit of like, what has the academic world thought up um, when it comes to queer ecologies? What, what does scholarship have to offer? And the Queer Eco Justice Project started as a reading group. Um, my second year in the MA program, I did a class at Cal, a DECAL class. I don't know if y'all have taken DECAL classes. I highly recommend it. You get a professor advisor to sign off on your topic and you co-create your own syllabus together. Um, and me and my friend Vanessa Raditz, who's the other co-founder of uh, QEP, the Career Justice Projects, started this class together and we spent hours and hours just 
reading and talking about ideas and plunging into things. And these are some of the, um, the main pit stops on our, on our journey. And out of that, we created the Puerto Rico Justice Project. But I just wanted to share this quote by Jose Munoz. Queerness is not yet here. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as a warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. The future is queerness's domain. And I love this quote because when we think of climate change and we get a lot of bombardment with the doom and gloom of there is no future. And for a good era of queer scholarship and queer studies, uh, no futures was it was it was a big um, sort of theme. And this book, Cruising Utopias, was a big challenge to that. Like, what are we imagining as queer folks into the future? And what do we have as queer folks specifically to offer in a future where adaptation and survival and new ways of being will be central to how we get there, to get to the world that we need? Uh, elaborating on this, so there's three buckets of work that kind of get into um, the academic world and beyond about what is queer ecology. So the first bucket is gender, sexuality, and biodiversity, right? The expansiveness of non-human life on this planet. And then the second bucket of work is very much about queering environmental politics, asking and historicizing questions of like, how did nature and sexuality as we understand them come to be? When did natural become natural? When did what is natural become morally neutral, right? When, um, you know, when did sexual actions become identities? So that's like one other bucket. And then the last bucket is what I like to call queers in space, space, space. Like, <laughs> um, which is basically like looking at the sexual politics of uh, non-urban places, rural and wild places, and traces a lot of histories, um, probably far too many histories of cis white male queers, but a lot of histories of queers outside of urban spaces and asking questions of how did queerness become uh, synonymous with um, urban life and deconstructing some of the ways that the natural world or wild spaces have been um made into this campaign of like this is where people go to perform white male rugged identity and then later to perform suburban family nuclear relationships right like the cul-de-sac away from home the way national park systems got designed so a lot of so those are sort of the three buckets that um, there's a lot of scholarship about already um so i like to go in a little bit on that first bucket because it seems very simple but I think it's actually far more special than we give it credit for um, in the ways that we talk about the biological exuberance of non-human life. So this is this little collage is like, this is what we usually think of when we think about biodiversity, like the big flora and the big fauna, right? Vast and seemingly endless species. And then this past year of living through this pandemic, we've all been made much more aware of the, the the web of life that we cannot see that we're also a part of this microscopic world right like at any given point half of our human body is made up of microbial cells like that's a queer thing in itself like we are uh, a good amount of us is non human as we walk around in this world right now. So a lot of the way this has been presented to us has been through this lens of evolutionary thought that's also been that's that's also been bent on suppressing the like deep complexity and diversity of the world we live in. So to clear this up a bit, I like to do this little queer ecology quiz. Oh, whoops, why are you going backwards? Presentation. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'm not gonna do the whole quiz just to save us time, but we'll, we'll do a few because I like hearing from folks. So the way this works is I'm gonna personify one of these creatures here. And y'all are going to put in the chat who you think that I am, okay? So, <laughs> I have over 36,000 documented sexes. Who am I? Mm. 
Lots of guests for number two. Y'all are in your fungi ecology. It is number two. There are over 36,000 different forms of embodiment and sexual, asexual, and non sexual strategies that fungi have. It's a really cool thing. Next one. By day, I open up my pollen uh, producing flowers, and by night, I open up my pollen receiving or fruit producing flowers. And so throughout a 24 hour cycle, I am just shifting the different forms of gender expression, expression on myself as a single plant. Who am I? All right, y'all have got it. It is the avocado tree. Um, and I like using that language instead of male flowers and female flowers because it doesn't actually describe, like, what are we talking about? We're talking about some flowers that produce pollen, some flowers that make fruit. Can we have language that actually expresses the processes that we're talking about and identifying? Um, and that's a, a querying in itself that we'll talk more about. Okay, let's do a couple more. Um, I am a microbial animal that can produce sexually or asexually, depending on what's most strategic for me. And I'm already the toughest animal on earth. Who am I? Okay, we got some guesses. We got different answers now. Okay. The answer is number 10. That is a, oh no, my presentation is like hopping all around for me. Spoilers. Okay. Sorry, y'all. Something is going on with this mouse that I'm using. All right. Spoilers, spoilers. Okay, back to the quiz. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so number is number 10. It's the tardigrade. Okay, and then we'll do one more. Um, let's let's see Ooh, which one do I want to do? Okay, this one. I will raise young in communities of up to six other mothers and will share suckling. Uh, responsibilities among the young. We're generally not sexual partners, but we do co-parent. Who are we? See, I don't see the right answer yet here. One more guess. I don't see it yet. Okay, I'm gonna give it away. It's number nine, the grizzly bears. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna keep us going, but there, all of these have some, some great things uh, going on for them. These uh, goals here, along with many other geese and gulls, adopt abandoned eggs from hetero pairings and raise them in same-sex pairings. Um, geckos are all female species, often despite those gecko commercials. Uh, and, <laughs> and then with the slugs and, um, Nemo clownfish here, there's a lot of species that transition from having small gametes to large gametes, aka sperm to eggs over the course of the time that they're alive, right? So all of this to say, there's endless variations to how life finds a way on this planet. And I love this. Um, this is a children's book based on Evolution's Rainbow, which is a, a book by ecologist Joan Roughgarden. And this quote, in biology, nature abhors a category. Despite the strains and containment we try to put on everything, things are constantly showing us that there is variation, differentiation, and adaptation. Um, and uh, if you're looking for this book, I'm, I'm down to share uh, resources later on. But it's a really beautiful set of illustrations um, and infor beautiful information. Right, so yeah, many different types of embodiment, of kinship, the ways that we care for each other, of bonding, affection, courtship, that hold a lot of lessons for us about adapting, surviving, and cooperating on this planet. And it's the breadth of this diversity that assures resilience in balanced ecological systems. So why, when we get to our human diversity, um, and the vast diversities of cultures, do we get this crime against nature piece? When I started farming, I was like, oh my gosh, nature is the queerest thing on earth. <laughs> it is earth, <laughs> um, right? So a lot of this is based on a worldview that is centered on monocultures, right? We're constantly trying to get out of this resolutely dualistic way of thinking and monocultures, monocultures of the land and monocultures of the mind have the same effect on our planet, right? It's this 
idea that there's one model of development that's based on endless growth and consumption, that it's a possible thing, the belief that one assimilated world culture is idea, when truly it leaves us the most vulnerable to crisis, right? Just as planning a monoculture leaves uh, ecosystems the most vulnerable to crisis. Right, so in my work at MG, we dig into this a lot more, like we do like a whole four or five day retreat where we unpack a lot of the, these um, ideas and frames, but at the gist of it is biological and cultural diversity are inextricably linked in a way that <clears throat> makes it uh, impossible for us to believe that one way of being, thinking, doing is idea for any system. Okay, so uh, getting at uh, another little example here. Um, there's a direct overlap in like linguistic and plant diversity on the planet. Like there's a, a map basically that shows like wherever there's intense biological diversity, there's also an intense diversity of languages and thus an intense diversity of cultures. And why this is important in the work of queering and also decolonizing how we think and interact with uh, the relatives around us is just exhibited in a few little pieces of what's in a name. So. In this activity, just looking at the this first flower, folks usually know it as a dahlia. Like, okay, dahlias, they're beautiful. I love growing dahlia, those wonderful bulbs. Um, but they're named by, you know, the Swedish dude who invented the, the um, uh, botanical naming system. And he named it after a friend of his. He's like, dahlia, it's great. The Nahuatl name for dahlia is coco socio, which means water pipe flower, which actually describes the morphology of the actual plant, right? It's got a, 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 syringe, a thin syringe uh, opening, an opening water piece. Um, and then uh, Wheatley, which is the second flower, which we call amaranth, which is Spanish called amaranth, um, means, um, Scrolling down, it's it's related to a god, which means uh, the hummingbird's left hand, and the hummingbird is a common pollinator of that plant of the wheatley plant. And then only socio means bone or twin flower, and as you can see on the morphology of the plant, you have two flowers going side to side. So like a lot of um, Indo-European languages were were made out of sedentary agriculture, the very object based a lot of indigenous languages are very relationship-based. Um, so being able to uh, look at a place and, and, and uh, process and describe it and observe it um, in a way that breaks away from a lot of these like uh, contained Indo-European ways of seeing the world is very helpful in understanding how things relate and bridge together. So just one example I wanted to share of some of the like daily undoings that happen around language and around food and um, natural interactions. So bottom line on that, binary thinking around a piece of diversity. I love this little drawing because on one side it's four and on the other side it's three. <laughs> um, all right. So getting into some overall gaps in understanding like all of this is great. What's missing in queer ecology in terms of what do, what do we need to uh, catalyze around and what are some of the gaps in our movement? So starting with en environmental movements, the botanical language system needs to make over. We just kind of went over that and the ways in which we come to understand the natural world. Um, environmental orgs need more diverse leadership, representation, and culture. And this is true a lot across a lot of the institutions that we've built over the last 30 or 40 years, right? And there's a lot of folks doing that work right now that I'm going to share more about in a bit. Um, and then there's this toxins narrative that needs a really big intervention in the way that folks talk about toxins in the environment. Like I have this frog here because there's this whole, um, understanding of the feminization of frogs is this like big scary 
uh, assault on masculinity um, and the way people talk about it. And the water is turning people gay. There's all, you know, or the chicken, the estrogen in the chicken, all of these things that gets perpetuated that are just like, no, 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 no. Can we talk about this as like, this is disrupting the self-determination, the collective determination of an ecosystem, right? There's more interesting questions to ask around other than is it natural? Can we ask, is it consensual? Is it, re is it reinforcing resilience? Is it caring? Is it joyful? Does it support the social and ecological well being of the planet, right? It's just reframing that doesn't um, keep us in this loop of like, this is, this is a fear based piece and, and, and justifying more and more violence and um, harm against our communities. And then in LGBT movements, I'm sure this comes up a lot in a lot of discussions, right? Um, the emphasis on these three pieces over the last 40 years has been a lot about, oops, okay, did it again with this thing. Um, it's been a lot about creating an acceptable homonormative subject, right? And a lot of our work and a lot of the tensions and struggles um, have been about racial and economic justice being a central part of our queer liberation movements. And that's been a lot of work over the last 34 years, so much less adding an ecological lens um, is, uh, is sort of like the, the, the crux of this. And I don't wanna like get stuck in like an oppositional politics around this. I, I feel like so much of the, the work and the concessions won um, in our movements have made it possible for some of the radical, incredibly intersectional youth led movements that we're seeing today. Um, but it is sort of the, yeah, the, the crux of the tension in our movements and the gaps that are, are an extension of the ways in which we, we continuously silo how we think about our work and beginning to remake our organizations, remake our movement narrative uh, towards an intersectionality and it's hard, right? It's what we haven't done. It's like we're all practicing science fiction together when we do this work, right? And transforming. And we have a lot ahead of us, right? <clears throat> so I don't know if y'all got a chance to read any of those articles, but I'm just gonna quickly cover some of the like, what are the frontline realities that LGBTQ folks, especially queer trans folks of color are facing? And an injury of the saying, transition is inevitable, justice is not, right? Our central ecological processes on this planet are changing. We're gonna have to respond to them, but justice is never guaranteed in the ways in which uh, we, we will see the response and, and shifts in our political systems, right? So finding our front lines. So the primary examples coming from <clears throat> a lot of writers and thinkers is what are the ways in which our communities face barriers to preparedness in both the immediate pieces when we have uh, acute shocks, long-term um, consequences and in intermediate um, pieces as well. So there's an inadequate emergency and shelter system for many stories, especially after the fires of folks being turned away from places or not feeling safe in places and folks getting together and creating those spaces um, that are needed for our for immediate response. Um, we have high rates of food and housing insecurity among LGBTQ youth. All of that is compounded by extreme weather events, by extreme disasters. And I know a lot of this is like probably very up front to y'all, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, rural LGBTQ livelihoods go under resourced, right? I remember a few years ago hearing the statistics of like not all of the, the foundation funding across the country, like uh, how what a small amount has gone towards rural LGBTQ organizing and, and efforts to change that. Um, increasing health risks, like folks not having access to hormones, folks not having access to medications during acute crisis times, policing and incarceration. We're one of the most over-policed populations in the country. 
And as we saw with Texas last week, um, just how, and, and with the fires and with COVID, just uh, how incredibly under-resourced and neglected folks are who are locked inside. And then the exclusion of LGBT, LGBTQ elders and folks with disabilities from essential resources during times of crisis and in long-term ways. So the kind of response to this for us at MG and the way that we think about organizing is resilience-based organizing. Um, and this is what our communities have been doing for a long time, right? Like I wanna just emphasize, this is nothing new. This is the Black Panther Breakfast Program. This is folks asserting the right and the a capacity to self-govern. Um, oh, we got more people coming in, that's cool. And I'm gonna go over the three principles of this pretty quickly so we can get to some q and And I'm throwing a lot at y'all, but um, I think it's, it's helpful. So the first principle of RBO, resilience-based organizing, is visioning a, new, uh, a transformative narrative. Like people cannot go where they haven't already been in their minds. So how are we broad broadcasting what a queer ecological future can look like? What can it feel like? What can it taste like, right? Doing that work of envisioning has been a lot of what I've seen in the networks and coalitions I've been a part of um, or privy to in the last five years, right? And one of those projects for QEP was the Fire and Flood series. Um, I sent the trailer out and we've been doing screenings at various universities and whatnot, but it's highlighting different voices from folks post um, uh, Maria in Puerto Rico in 2017 and post fires up here in 2017, 2018. Um, a really powerful uh, set of voices and a really great way for folks to connect and begin to map out what are some of the strategies and responses we're using and what are some of the gaps and shared experiences that we're having. Um, and the kind of core, one of the core themes for, for across this is it's like, we have the magic for this. Like, and as queer and trans folks of color in particular, like this, this is like the jam <laughs> um, in terms of the, the communities of care we've created and um, how we can continue to amplify and adapt. And then the second one is what you feed grows. So restoring our labor is a big piece for us. Um, a lot of that work means taking our labor as much as we can out of the chains of the, chains of the market and putting it back into the web of life. And a big piece for me around that has been connecting with um, queer and trans BIPOC folks who are doing land stewardship and food sovereignty and food justice work. Um, this is one example of a project in East Oakland, the 23rd Avenue building that was um, has been a, a space but led by Cutie Pop folks for 13 years. It's four storefronts in East Oakland. Uh, we bought it in 2017 with the Oakland Community Land Trust. I say we, I don't, I'm not a part owner of it, but the residents bought it with the Oakland Community Land Trust. Um, and then there's a bike shop there, there's a community space run by Peacock Rebellion, and there's a beautiful garden that cuts across those projects. Um, I've helped do some garden work over the years there, but that's just one of the examples of folks um, uh, creating resilient community spaces as QE Park folks. And the third pillar and the hardest one, but the one we need the most uh, is contesting for power, right? It's, um, you know, taking the, the, the idea that if we're not prepared to govern, we're not prepared to win. Um, we say it a lot at MG and it's, it's, it's hard, but it's asserting our right to collectively govern. And I think that spark, a, a lot of that spark um, began at Standing Rock for a lot of movement organizing work that I see happening today. And one of the projects that I wanted to highlight was Segorite Land Trust, um, is a, a Ohlone Women's Led Land Trust based here in the Bay Area. Um, they have a, a Shumi land tax for folks who are not native to pay into helping uh, secure 
uh, rematriation of Ohlone land back to indigenous stewardship, um, and also have a number of other partnerships. If you're not familiar with Segorte, I highly encourage you to check them out. They're doing some really pivotal work, right? The taking from occupations where we assert the, that crisis of jurisdiction of who actually has the right to govern here, to do healing space here, to be here, as we saw in Standing Rock and so many other places, and moving into the like long-term stewardship strategies of how do we take land out of the speculative market for the long term and return to a way of thinking about our region as a bioregional form of governance, right? How do we think about our watershed together? How do we think about our food shed together? Um, how do we get past the political borders of this map so that we can actually take care and, of the place that we're in? And the last things I want to share is just some examples of like, this is a budding movement. Like I said, I went to Creating Change in 2015. There was this small conversation I had just done. I'd been woofing over the years and I had just done a permaculture course or something and was like, you know, how do I get back to land full time before I started farming again? Um, and now everywhere I look, I'm just like, Gen Z is out here. They get it, they're doing it. <laughs> so I wanted to highlight some projects that I think are really cool. Youth versus Apocalypse, which is an Oakland-based project here. Um, all of these projects are started or founded or co-run by queer and trans youth of color. I'm just like, y'all are here. So Youth versus Apocalypse, our climate voices, um, they have a great listening series they just started. The first episode is on queer liberation and climate justice with um, voices from climate activists from around the world. Uh, Seeding Sovereignty is an indigenous queer led project. They're doing a lot of amazing mutual aid work. Uh, Zero Hour is another mass action organizing project that was started by a, a queer person of color. Um, and then some other budding movement work. Uh, we've been working uh, a lot with Sins Invalid at NG, um, doing a shared study together, but they're uh, amazing disability justice, queer and trans BIPOC led group. They do performance and they do political education work. Um, and there's just a ton to learn uh, from folks at the front lines of access centered movement building. Um, like more than I can describe in a small amount here, but Disability Justice Culture Club is also another project that I wanted to highlight for folks doing some amazing work. Uh, Interlocking Roots is this network of farmers and earth workers or cutie BIPOC folks that I'm a part of. You can kind of see me there in the yellow shorts in this picture. Um, back in the days when we can gather in person, we had some, some beautiful big gatherings at a Allen Media Conference and just folks starting to connect and map together around like, what does this look like for, for us? What does it look like to build this movement space um, and to yeah, amplify? This is another project, the Institute for Queer Ecology. It's a little bit more artsy and nerdy if, if folks are into that, but they, they're making a lot of really interesting um, artistic interventions. They had a time capsule project they put together. And then last but not least, the people of the global majority in the outdoors, nature and environment a set of conferences that have happened which over, I think the first one was in 2017, the last in-person one was in 2019 brought together thousands of people, a lot of queer and trans folks who work in so many different spaces and just have not had the space to be like, this, this is, um, this is the, the new vision we're broadcasting. This is like beyond asking for representation and hella white organizations, this is creating our own thing. Um, and they're in a reorganization stage now, but when they're back and doing public events, highly encourage folks to check them out. Um, and then this is a project I really like from a, a friend who interviewed LGBTQ farm workers as part of their UC Davis research and they have this website with some great storytelling audio if you're interested um, in checking that out. And then last but not least, the Critical Justice Project. Um, right now we've been focused mainly on the film and then, you know, doing workshops and whatnot and incorporating uh, various coalition things that we're doing and with all our hats uh, on, but it's definitely been a great labor of love and has uh, given a lot of fruit. So with that, I'm going to stop. I think I might have gone over half an hour, but 
Hopefully we still have time for questions. Yeah, we definitely do. So Desi, uh, Desi, that was great uh, for many reasons, uh, including the hopefulness of it. Um, and so we're the perfect size for conversation. So folks, if you'd like to um, speak into the group, uh, feel free to show yourself by video if you're comfortable with that. If not, that's cool. And uh, so the floor is open. Well, thanks for joining. And I know some folks came in late, um, but totally cool to, don't, don't worry about me repeating things if you have questions. Uh, let's see, I see David. David, do you wanna uh, start? Yeah, sure. Uh, I lo absolutely love this. Um, some was familiar, some of the theory from my days as a professor, um, a lot of stuff new, it's really wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, just last night I was at a, a small meeting for some folks working on biodiversity. Um, but we're gonna be meeting with uh, the city of San Francisco with um, folks who are working on their climate plan. And they're coming out with this you know, big plan with like lofty goals. Um, and the, it's to, it is totally siloed, it seems, in terms of folks who are working on the nature aspect and folks who, even though it has uh, principles in it for um, environmental, uh, environmental justice, or I think they use equity language. I'm just wondering if any of the groups that you're familiar with who are doing this really great work on resilience and very community level stuff are also engaging with policymakers on any of the sort of policy that's getting enacted, you know, here and now as cities retool, mm -hmm. you know, to try to be more uh, climate resilient. Yeah, I mean, I feel like so on a like more national state level, one of the vehicles that I think is really interesting is the Climate Justice Alliance, um, putting out like part think tank and putting out a lot of visionary policy and being at a lot of those tables that are usually like the usual suspects in terms of regional planning work. Um, and then I know the client, like in terms of Oakland, the Climate Action Network, Oakland Climate Action Network, I'm sorry, it's like alphabet soup in my head. <laughs> I know that they've been, um, engaged in a uh, city planning process for a long time. Um, I'm not quite sure where it is right now, but those are some of the, the two vehicles that come to my head right away, like the two projects that I know are in the, at the policy table um, in, a, in a more ongoing way in terms of holding campaign space and then stakeholder space at some of those um levels yeah but i feel like you know it's all connected like i think a lot of the groups that are doing the mass action work you know a lot of the political will comes out of that to to go beyond what's politically realistic towards some some more visionary interventions so yeah i hope that's helpful I definitely don't know all the things, but yeah, those are some definitely of the helpful. <laughs> I guess I, I would just say one thing from my days. I I came up in in ACT UP New York. You know that was my introduction to activism, and I really loved. I I felt very lucky that I was part of a group that was willing to sort of have a big vision about what people deserved, but also fight for the you know the here and now. And every once in a while. I'll just say extinction rebellion. Like I, I'm interested. It's nice, but I want to see more than symbolic actions. Mm -hmm. I want to see both and, and uh, that that's I guess my dream for it. That it shouldn't just be we do something symbolic, and then the other groups are working on the, the policy. But you know, anyway. Thanks very much. This is wonderful. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your comment. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of the work. You know, some of so much of it isn't is it isn't those big visible moments. So much of it is the relationship building and the trust building um, that you just don't see, and then and then the sparks fly. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you're, you're, on, you're on mute. You probably remember the name Farinwa rather than the longer version of my name. Um, I I put in the chat an experience I had years ago. Uh, I was invited to a conference called Queer University. It was an annual conference at Eastern Michigan University. And they invited me to give a presentation. And the presentation I gave was titled um, Kwanzaa Principles, A Necessity for Queer Culture. And my intent was to talk about the ecology of our collectivity, our collectivity living on this planet together and how we do that and, and how the principles of Kwanzaa would facilitate that. Not be the only facilitation, but certainly would be one that made sense, I, you know. Um, and there seemed to be an attitude of there were queer people over here and those straight folks over there. And if they were not identifying themselves as queer, they weren't going to be included in whatever solutions and resolutions that were being uh, developed. And I thought that's really, um, you know, I'm thinking of my grandmother as a person who was an ecologist mm -hmm. and she would not have called herself queer. And yet she wanted the world to be, to survive for everyone who was to come. Now, somehow that kind of dogmatism, whether no matter where we find it, is going to be something that's antithetical to our, our work. And I heard you use the term silos that are sometimes developed around particular issues or processes or um, uh, commitments. Somehow that for me is the key to the problem area. Um, if, if trees set up a, a silos, they'd never have a forest. Trees are wiser than that. Um, that's what I'm, I'm kind of, the flexibility that we need comes from our interactions with all the different kinds of people that there are in the world not just a certain popular group at this point in a popular space, in a particular space. Um, so and that's not directly attacking things like the water issue in, um, in Ohio, but it is an issue. I mean, in Michigan, excuse me, I'm thinking of Ohio because I used to live there um, in Michigan, but and there is a water issue in, in Ohio too, but we're not seeing it that way. We see it, we see things, it seems like we continue to take a situation in Michigan as unrelated to a situation in Mississippi or for that matter at the border. Water is water. Mm -hmm. So, how do we get through that? I mean, when you start particular, when you start, when you call it a queer view, are you trying, are you also explaining to people that aren't necessarily calling themselves queer that they're included? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's what's so exciting to me. Like one of my, my close farmer friends uh, who, is indigenous once told me that for for her like queering and decolonizing are two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. and um what i think is exciting especially around the like budding movements that have been started and founded by a lot of young queer youth led folks mm -hmm. their platforms the things they're making our climate voices youth versus the apocalypse are like the most some of the most radically inclusive um like uh, stances I've I've seen, you know, like they're they're fully standing in who they are and, and how the connections of um, uh, their identities relate to their relationship to a changing climate, but they're not making projects that are just for people who share their exact same experiences of the world. They're very much like 
uh, guided by movement elders, very much intersectional and having mm -hmm. them at the center of it means that they won't be invisibilized, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it's really easy for us to recreate the, the gaps and failures of mainstream institutions that are in that monoculture of like, we're just going to listen to white cis men and they know what's going on and that's all we're going to do, right? But when we, you know, in creating, creating a, a, a world that works for everyone, it's going to be a lot more complex and messier. Our capacity to embrace that complexity, I'm just like, I really see it like embodied in some of the, the, the youth-led work that's coming out now. And um, yeah, so I, I guess that's, that's sort of my answer. Like, I think it's, it's a yes and. Like, I think that uh, asserting a, a queer lens doesn't make it exclusionary. It makes it all the more expansive. Um, as long yeah, as I don't we, think as asserting as a queer a queer stance is making it exclusion exclusive, but I do think that not paying attention to the wisdom that's already there is problematic. Mm -hmm. And I that kind of arrogance is for me similar to what we when we talk about cisgen white men doing. It's a it's a neo arrogance. Yes. Um, that that speaks of inclusion but doesn't act like it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that folks are, I, I'm seeing the, the bridges going in all directions is what I'm trying to say. And obviously there'll be mistakes and, and messiness because movements are messy and mm -hmm. people learn as they, as they go and hopefully continue to stay in it together. I think some of the, you know, the saddest things for me and when formations end is when conflict uh, between folks just lets everything crumble, you know, and that that's the heart, like some of the harder work. Like I think the in the next thirty years have some of the most important jobs there. Yeah, I agree. You're doing a fantastic work, Desiree. I was at that conference, the the uh, Creating Change conference, uh, where you gave the presentation. And another one where you gave a presentation at um, uh, TFAM. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah, that. my partner and I were the only two people who came to that one, but it was excellent that. as well. That was at... Um, I can't remember where it was. That one? Uh, City of Refuge. Yeah, was it at the City of Refuge? I believe it so. It was before we moved here. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay, glad I want to put it up to more folks because I know we are, we're running out of time. Maybe we okay. can get more. time for one more. more questions. Yeah. <clears throat> questions or comments, thoughts? Yes. I think Zebulon. Mm -hmm. Hi, Desiree. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. This is such a beautiful presentation. Sorry, I've been moving around a lot. I like need to make lunch, so I'm in my kitchen. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you, um, are there any like artists or like culture makers and uh, who, who you like feel like you like draw inspiration from? Like I'm just so affirmed and like encouraged to hear um, your emphasis on like the visionary and not just what not just what like we're told is possible or not like the ways that we're told that that possibility will 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 come. So I'm just curious, uh, like who who do you who do you like to listen to or like who 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 are some artists you feel like aligned with in in those values? Oh, cool! Thanks for that question. I appreciate that. Um, let's see, artists, so many people. I feel like. Um, well, the, the group that come, like I work with uh, my friend Lael, who works with the Center for Cultural Power and Fabiana Rodriguez runs that center. And she's just like, she's an open based artist and she's just made some really beautiful intersectional art pieces over the years. Um, and Fabi's like, just kind of like got gone really full full in on the climate justice work. So I'm I'm interested to see some of the, the pieces that she puts out and the folks she works with there at the Center for Cultural Power. Um, I'm like, what have I been listening to lately music music wise? 
um, that I could think of. Who know. The last thing I listened to was Little Dragon, which ne doesn't necessarily have like a, a a big ecological meaning, but they're one of my favorite artists. <laughs> I like their their voices. Um, yeah, if I think of anything else, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Uh, well, great. Um, I was just paying attention to the time here. It was really wonderful, uh, Desi. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind, we're, we have a, a real harvest this week of stuff happening here at CLGS. So tomorrow, um, our Jewish Roundtable query series is having a histories of LGBTQ Jewish activism in Europe and the US. So please join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And then a few hours later, our queer Latinx faith conversation is, is holding an Encuentros Latinx, advocating for the inclusion of uh, queer Latinx people in church and society with uh, Rina Ramos. So uh, we would love to see you all there. And um, uh, last words for you, Desi. It's really, really wonderful to, to have you in the series. Cool. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. If you're interested in more stuff that I'm up to or MG is up to, uh, check out our website. And um, I think it's all in the brochure, but I'll just put MG in here as well. We have a podcast coming out. We're going to have a queer ecology episode as part of that down the line. So keep an eye out for that. I know listening and watching things is, is at least the MO for the next however many months we're in this. So um, yeah, and yeah, feel free to get in touch if you have any uh, questions or musings you wanna share with me, this is my email. Cool, thanks Desiree. Thank you everyone yeah. for joining us. Thank you for coming, take care. Enjoy the, the warmth. If you're in a warm place, I know everyone's in different places. <laughs> All right, bye. Okay.